Perfect. So um, I was just should introduce you to the guys as well. So um, I've got a class in front of me. When we do the questions and answers, I might just turn the camera around so you can see them as well. So it's not just such a, a kind okay. of water thing. But uh, and then there's a couple of people joining us online as well from the fourth years. But the reason that I invited you primarily was to talk to the third year group which I'm working with now. So they're in the third year of their digital media degree. This is a visual effects module. So I thought it would be useful to have someone who's gone through a creative degree from art school, has worked a little bit in industry, and then set up their own business. Um, so talking a little bit about the journey path. And maybe we could start even um, you know, thinking about your major project in fourth year, like your, you know, uh, you were studying film, and um, but it was slightly different, maybe to the experience that students would have at Edinburgh Napier compared to uh, Edinburgh College of Art. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the, we've talked in the past about how important it is to find something that they're passionate and interested about um, as a major project, and um, maybe we could kind of start there before moving on to some of the more exciting things from the company. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, I started. I studied um, film and tel television, uh, visual communication in Edinburgh College of Art. So, um, I was. I've always been fascinated in the kind of um, the sort of classic uh, medium is the message. So, I kind of approached my film and TV degree uh, as a bit of a sort of scientific experiment, actually. So, I was fascinated in experimental film and TV and um, Look to kind of explore the the medium that we use, visual communication mediums, you know, uh, that we use uh, so much today, and uh, explore different ways of making them more effective. And and uh, fundamentally, most of my projects in during my degree were kind of like scientific experiments. <clears throat> um, I've always married science and art uh, together, really, and I sort of approached a lot of uh, my projects in a sense quite scientifically, often reducing the variables down to a few key things uh, to look at the efficiency of storytelling with just uh, you know, uh, very few variables. And The output was very experimental filmmaking, but it taught me a lot about how to use visual communication effectively. Excellent. And um, so that was quite well received at the art school as well. It was something a bit different from the types of stuff that they were normally getting, I think, at undergraduate level for sure. Mm. Um, and it wasn't long before you're kind of out in the real world after fourth year. And um, what was your process then of thinking? Because I've talked to the students a little bit before about my experience at art, college, at art school was that, um, you know, you have this great, rich experience. and But then when you're coming out, Especially at the time, there was very, I felt like, little preparation to say, okay, now you're out in the real world. Uh, this is the, you know, this is the, the, the industry as it is. I think you were very well prepared to be a, a creative person, but not necessarily kind of geared up. What was your process then for moving outside of art college and into the real world? Into Yeah, um, so I think there's a few things there. I think that for me, uh, a degree is, um, there's a lot of, similarities with doing a degree well and uh, working outside uh, in a professional environment. Um, you know, at the end of the day, a degree is, uh, the concept of degree fundamentally teaches you how to work well within a certain amount of parameters. I mean, the outside professional world has even more restrictive parameters and you've got to find a way of uh, satisfying your own inner kind of creativity within those parameters and the degree does if you take a lot out of your degree it should prepare you well at least for that I think um, I've always uh, I think I, well when I was actually doing my degree I sort of was hell-bent on starting to work uh, in the uh, professionally at the same time so I um, I think if you remember, I was working as a cameraman at the same time, and I felt like those experiences were really key to not only bolster up my CV to make me more um, attractive when going into the marketplace, the, uh, but also to just give me a, a bit of a deeper understanding of, of what yeah. how demands would change when you're in the professional world. 
Um, I mean, the uh, the difference when you do go out there, for, fundamentally, I think, is the workload. Uh, I think, um, I mean, people would do, uh, in the film and TV degree I was doing, they would make a documentary, a 15-minute documentary for their entire fourth year. You know, that would be like one 15-minute documentary that they would make. Um, when I got out there, I ended up working in a company where we were pretty much a small team of two or three were pulling out documentaries every two weeks that we were going on television. So like you know, from BBC to Channel 4 and stuff like that. So the, the sheer um, workload increase is, is quite uh, fascinating. Yeah. I think we've identified from working with, um, with the industry that of course the degree is important but also the experiences. Um, the fourth year students now have a finishing module where they're preparing their portfolios Mm. Um, but of course, having some real life industry Absolutely. there is, is great. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I have to say, on that basis, you've got the um, you don't stop paying for you. Uh, how to say? You know, you do you don't stop paying for education when you leave your degree. I mean, um, you know, you have to be prepared to potentially work, uh, invest, carry on investing in in your in your career. I mean, you've got to be careful not to be abused by um, by industry but at the same time you've got to be prepared to work for very cheap and, and, and concentrate on getting um, very interesting experience. I've always uh, looked to have my career serve my passions rather than my passions serve my career in the sense that um, you know if you work hard enough you will get the job that you look look for. I mean, that it will happen. You just have to persevere. But um, So be careful what you choose to uh, do and make sure that it's something that's also going to nourish your um, long-term internal goals, you know, as a creative. Sure. I think there's, there's always an emphasis now um, in these modules, especially like this visual effects module where um, this is something I've talked about with the students as well, where as much preparing the students to learn independently, teaching them how to learn essentially, um, to prepare them to be lifelong learners, and I think that's something, mm. especially in this creative technical field, that you have to keep nurturing your technical and creative skills yourself as you move on. Absolutely. I mean, the digital landscape. I mean, I basically went into the industry at the point of um, when digital was really uh, sort of getting the stranglehold that it then uh, had that it started that it now has over the entire TV industry, you know, pretty much the first batch of uh, um, digital online editors and, and stuff were, were in my, my generation. So you've, so I saw how the digital landscape um, influenced, you know, the way we made TV, who made TV, uh, who made visual content. And I've, I think that if nothing, it's, um, I mean, when I first started editing, for example, and, and, and was, there was only like maybe three or four codecs <laughs> that you would choose. Uh, by the time I'd finished, and when I started to move on to something else, there were hundreds. Yeah. And 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 understanding when you have a deadline to get something that's already in the Radio Times, it's already, <laughs> and to get something in uh, on time, you 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 have to have a, the ability to constantly research. You know the the. The, the turbulence that was this digital landscape to make sure that you weren't going to get caught out by some new codec that didn't uh, talk happily with some other um, effect that you might have on the on the timeline and this that and the other and that's not changed no matter what you do in digital in fact it just increases that pace of variability and that 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 kind of turbulent landscape is is if if anything is 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 getting even faster nowadays. Yeah. I remember having a conversation with you back in 2002. It was even it seems amazing though, but just before um, you know YouTube even appeared, that uh, you know the importance of now designing for small screens, you know, and the different kind of experience that it would be watching a film or a TV show on a small screen compared mm -hmm. to you know um, abs accessing information through um, televisions, uh, larger screen formats. So it's interesting to say, you know, over you know ten years plus now, how that, how you know, has really come to be 
um, come to fruition, the way that we're absorbing and creating media now are much on these little dis displays and devices um, yeah, and, and, and the impact that's had on the industry. Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly, uh, I think that it's not where my, sort of my direction went towards questioning not just the way we'd make motion picture, but how, how would we make content in general? Like how, I think, I think where I am now, where I am now is um, trying to challenge the status quo and how you capture and deliver all content. Or the experience of the world around us, and that's that's one of the reasons why I've gotten into the technologies that I have. So that leads on quite nicely to the next question, which was: if you're having success in your career working for um, these big names for for Sky and doing things for the BBC. How do you? What made you then decide to establish your own company? What inspired you to? Think um, uh, well, the moment of madness, really. The, the, the um, I think that. I mean, I always, as I said earlier, I, the, I've always looked at having sort of my career serve my own purposes, and I was really fascinated in um, um, juxtaposition. I was, I was fascinated in the, especially the role the editor played in documentary filmmaking, which is kind of different from the, the role the editor plays in fictional filmmaking, because you tend to be the, part, the sort of uh, at the centre of the. Of, of the maelstrom when, when you're in, in documentary you have a, a cameraman with a very sorry look on his face coming back from Thailand with a shoebox full of tapes and the producer apologizing for not getting the really important interviews that you had and, and you have to do the the magic of sort of how um, the job for the documentary um, editor and and that's actually really enjoyable and I got a lot out of that. It taught me a lot how to, um, you know, specifically around juxtaposition, understanding, you know, what the crux of a story was, um, and this, that, and the other. But I, but I think my passions started to um, develop towards, um, or carry on going down what they had originally set out to go down, which was um, a passion in in medium its own in its own right. And um, and this common, this sort of marriage of technology and art, and uh, more specifically, um, I had become fascinated with the technologies of 3D scanning, having come across them in in, in my TV kind of uh, work life, and uh, kind of saddened that these amazing technologies were merely being used as a tool within a tool chain. Um, at best, they'd be used in a special effect. Most of the time, they're being used as a mechanism of scanning up architecture and I couldn't help but see them as really a uh, of deserving of a, of a place much more in the foreground of content and uh, coming from the back seats and putting you know that type of technology um, uh, into the f foreground was became a sort of new passion of mine and so starting the company was there wasn't any other company if I was six, seven years ago, um, if I was looking around for 3D scanning, bear in mind this is way before Connect happened, um, and uh, there was really just no understanding of, of 3D scanning apart from the niche industries that supported it. For um, you know, if I looked around, the only companies that were doing it were doing it, as I say, in the service of what I thought were really sort of boring uses, and really weren't sort of matching the the wonder that I had about it. So I felt that I kind of had to, I think from one angle I was, I saw that there was definitely, uh, there's an entrepreneurial kind of moment for me which saw that there was definitely value in pursuing this very unique direction of treating the 3D scan as content in its own right. But then from the other angle I, I realized that there was a huge amount of um, Gaps and lack of technologies to be able to do that. I mean, it's a without trying to waffle too much, it's a whole different ball game from taking something that works kind of in the lab with a lab technician and and the technology that you use to make artistic content. I mean, you know, there's a difference between a photography camera like a Nikon D800 and a, and a scientific video camera. Yeah, I was even thinking about the concept, the creative concept of marrying these two things together, seeing a technology 
and then curating and thinking about uh, implications for that. So now, of course, there's all the exciting things which are happening with the Connect. But before that, I remember again having a conversation with you about you know if you can capture depth data at the same time as recording footage, you could do all sorts of exciting things. So you know, change the way, for example, chroma keying works. So that you know, if you can separate someone from their background. There's lots of implications for potential. Yeah, I mean, I kind of decided to kind of become more bold than that. I think where my passion sort of grew really was just this very clean, clear-cut some concept of saying, you know, this deserves to be content in its own right. I mean, people take photographs and they don't say, what's this photograph for? They enjoy the photograph. You know, they, they we take film, we, we film things and we sit down and we watch that film. And for some reason, when we take a 3D scan and we show someone a 3D scan, they go, oh, okay, and is this going to be part of the special effects or is this going to be part of this? And it's, that's, that's a shame. And I, wanted to, I want to change that perception people have about that, that technology. And the way to do that is, well, the approach that we've taken is um, going through, you know, the marketing experience. I think um, leveraging the growth in mobile marketing and uh, towards, you know, our goals of getting this type of concept into the group consciousness, really. Yeah. So, some times gone by now since establishing your company. What was your original vision then? Mm. You've talked a little bit about the 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 ideas before for setting up the company. Mm. But when you were when you established it, did you you must have had in mind some kind of markets um, that you that you wanted to target uh, initially? What, what were they? What how you know it might be, you know, thinking about where you're at now mm. and how it's changed. You know how you've had to adapt and and, and the company's <coughs> evolved. Can you remember what your original kind of vision was? For yeah, I mean, the original vision was to, um, you know, look at you know really you know the value of creating content that um, you know that's that's in shape and form as as well as image. You know, for me. For me, it's like bringing color to the black and white movie. You know, it's it's to it's the same thing to CGI what photography was to painting. You know, it's and to complete that sort of concept, you have to create an application for that type of content. You know, and so you have to not only sort of invent the technology. So spent a lot of years um, developing the technologies that make this able to be used as a professional artistic tool you know in in, in, in the studio but also um, sort of championing the concept that this is valuable to content creators or to brands as a means of marketing or as a content a type of content in its own right and you have to kind of approach things from both um, angles you know to, to create something that's meaningful but so the original vision was very much you know the seeing this as a valuable type of content that was more relevant to the 21st century than a hundred year old you know technology that is a motion picture mm -hmm. you know I mean. um, so how did you start working then we've talked a little bit about where you sit in in a wider environment or pipeline um, you've been working with some pretty exciting companies so time slice this technology, of course, was used in films like The Matrix. Uh, how did you start to work with partners like that then? How did your paths cross? Um, basically, uh, quite frankly, I just phoned them up. I mean, it just so happens that the managing director of Time Slice is also called Callum. And uh, I think um, at the time, this is about seven years ago, six years ago, uh, you know, when I started DigiCave, we didn't have any technology, we didn't have anything really. We just I had to fly around and meet different scientists that were that had sort of some algorithms that could sort of do you know fairly good photogrammetic had photogrammetry and bits and pieces and and develop relationships with them. Ended up um, developing a relationship with our, our sort of chief scientist that was uh, at the time working for Toshiba Robotics Vision Lab. Uh, his name is Dr. Carlos Fernandez Esteban. And uh, you know, we, I was just I was trying to assemble all the the parts, and um, and if you like, uh, um, you know, champion the concept that I've just put across to you guys, you know, to, to these guys that were in their separate industries at the time, and the proposition to Time Slice at, at the time was, you know, that they were, um, how to say. 
uh, they're sort of uh, restricted to having their technology only useful for special effects, which um, is actually a fairly narrow industry. The camera array industry at large is probably worth no more than 20 million a year, you know, globally. Um, because you know it just serves this, that special effect, and uh, what our proposition is is that you know the camera array uh, technologies could begin to serve mass markets that are um, far greater than you know that have far greater value, uh, and therefore like leverage those fantastic skill sets and capabilities into far larger markets um, and far larger and more sustainable markets. Sure. So that's, I mean, I basically, you know, was calling people up, making the business case, and then developing partnerships and relationships in the early days. And then after that, we spent, um, we became quickly became good friends and partners at Time Slice. They're now our sister company, so we work as one. And um, we probably, and then we ended up, uh, there was an exchange of equity, and we, and we went over to the studio in, in the States, and we worked there for two months, kind of developing the technologies, uh, getting them ready to be able to be used, as I say, like in anger. I mean, there's a whole different thing when you can just about make something work, uh, or, or to when you have to go in there and there's Scarlett Johansson, and you've got to capture her, and you've got to turn it around, and you've got to make sure your footage doesn't, is, is going to work, and it's going to be to the standard that, that, that they need, and that there is, a there is you, you know, there's a development cycle of years between one thing and the other, and we did that together over a few years. Okay, great. And and the types of client then that you've worked with over the years have obviously been pretty varied as well as the yeah. rapidly evolved. Can you tell us a little bit about a um, one of the shoots or one of the clients that you worked with, which was particularly memorable? I mean, it's a, it's a testimony to the concept that we're putting across that this um, mark this kind of new content has that value to many different clients and brands. I mean, we've worked with from HTC to Science Museum to. Um, Places like NHL or, as you know, History Channel and Marvel and Disney, and, you know, and you know, you got you got such a variety of, of of clients. It shows that you know that what we're doing is is making sense. That we are showing the ubiquitous value of this type of content and these and, and these technologies that were up until now resigned to just working for special effects. Um, in fact, yeah. So I mean. Uh, Actually, probably, have you got that video I sent you an email? Um, yeah, so I'll try and do a screen share. I was just looking on your um, work archive, and I can see as well the work with the Science Museum of James May. And I remember seeing that on on, um, on BBC Click. And then yeah. thinking, you know, we used to see that and think that, you know, you made it in the industry when you're on, on Click. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I used to think that. Yeah. And um, it was great. We got the mobile technology highlight of uh, 2012, which was fantastic. You know, at the time, mm -hmm. thanks to that project. Um, and uh, I, I think the the recent work that we're doing, if we can show that video that I've just um, sent you with uh, with Marvel and Disney, is very much the culmination of all of these years of work. It kind of represents um, kind of every uh, the first baby step from our point of view of of where this content is going. Um, I was trying to flip to the screen uh, there, but it's showing some of my text. I'm not sure how to choose something else. Clever, clever Google Hangout. Yeah. Um, I'll come back to that while I ask you another question. Because cool. right. uh, workflow, especially in this module, is something that we've talked about and is important. And the coursework these guys are working on now, we're talking about pre-visualization um, in terms of the pre-production stage. So wondering then, thinking about a typical workflow for, for DigiCave, how important is pre-production in real life? Is it something that is just talked about in theory? Um, you know, these are all the skills you would have learned from a, as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. How are you applying those skills then to, to your... Well, the, the unique type of content that we make is actually incredibly demanding because it requires pre-production uh, coming from the special effects industry, pre-production for games, a pre-production for film and TV, uh, and and even a photography shoot. It's a combination of all of those, uh, and so pre-production is an absolute must. I mean, um, when you're working in the mobile industry, you certainly need to have wireframes and sort of 
UX and stuff like this signed off from the client's perspective to you know, it's just as a means of good practice but also because otherwise you'll find yourself in a uh, right pickle but we've got a very complex challenge that is you know the amount of skill sets the variety of skill sets that you have to have work together to make DigiCave happen is very unique I mean uh, Mark our 3D guy he used to work for Terry Gilliam as the lead special effects guy you know so <laughs> to give you an idea you've got you've got that and then you've got you know our head of uh, of, of tech is, is EA Games and Sony, so you've got a games guy, a head of special effects guy, and then we've got our designer, and we've got mobile guy that specialises in mobile. We've got we got specialists in in in, in back end, and when you have so many various skill sets that need to plug into each other, it's incredibly crucial to have um, good pre production in place. Um, my favourite person, one of my favourite people in my team is definitely my digital producer because and his background was from film and TV and it really took somebody to have a background in film and television to be able to handle DigiCave's pre-production and production because film and television I think is one of the only industries that can potentially have such a variety of skill sets that need to be sort of intermingled and pulled together. Um, so yeah, no, we the one issue is that like anything the client is is the person that tends to heat to take to to scupper all, all all your all your best laid plans basically um, by not adhering to the timescales and the pre-production necessities of your project. And that will always happen. Okay, I've got the Captain America movie that you sent me. Yeah. Work on Google. I'll see if I can do it on the Hangout as well. If it doesn't right. work, then I'll just play it. Okay. The students here. Can you hear me at the same time? Uh, yeah, so I think it has a, a small kind of soundtrack on it. No, oh, okay, it doesn't need soundtrack. So you could probably just switch the... Turn the sound down. Yeah, yeah. turn the sound down and see what happens. Okay. Mm. Is that playing? Yeah, it's so just starting. Yeah. yeah, so this was some um, project that we've just done for Disney and stuff. Um, what happened here is this is an augmented reality mobile uh, experience so that for every poster of Captain America in America and in Canada and Hong Kong and stuff like that, you get this experience of Captain America smashing through the glass. He was actually shot um, as a sculptural photograph by um, Nels Israelson, who's one of the top five uh, photographers uh, in LA. He does all the a lot of, most of the billboards and posters. And this project really signifies kind of uh, an ultimate. Uh, kind of coming together of everything we've been pushing forward you know this is what we're doing here is leveraging uh, existing skill sets and talent such as Nels Israelson who's been in the game for 30 years as one of the top end photographers and his capabilities and we're uh, enabling him with the capability of creating content for digital marketing which is um, uh, and if you from an industry perspective uh, fairly crucial at the moment um, you know, I think the statistics from last year were 6% of uh, uh, all that marketing was digital and then um, it got 26% of the visibility. So it's fairly crucial to find a way of uh, enabling, you know, traditional marketing uh, to, to access the digital uh, experience. With this, people can then, you know, plug into social media and this, that and the other and it's been a very successful campaign on Twitter and Instagram around the Captain America movie. It, it is for me uh, a suitable digital experience for uh, mobile because it's merely a moment, piece of little moment of magic, you know, your mobile phone isn't, shouldn't necessarily be the thing you use to watch an entire feature film on, um, nor should it be necessarily you know, with its processing and capability, should it be necessary just used to watch the flat motion picture? So here we're kind of reducing that experiential moment, but also making it more suitable and, and very much native to to, to the to technologies that, that we're using. So that again is the marrying a couple of other technologies as well um, at the display stage. So you've got a marrying with some of the time slice rig guys to actually capture the image, the acquisition stage, then you've got the DigiK processing of that. Um, how does it work then with the, did you, 
develop your own version of some technology for the display of the work, or were you marrying again with other partners? There? Yeah, no. So I mean, we tend to. So everything is pretty much in house, really. The um, I mean, we actually designed the rig with Time Slice that captures it. So, um, and uh, you know, fundamentally, it's designed around looking to uh, capture the actual light from the photographer. A lot of 3D scanning technologies are really there to set up to capture um, something under flat lighting conditions so that they can be relit after the fact. Uh, in our sort of our requirement is very different and uh, it sort of changed the design to, to how we capture things because we're looking at preserving the light from the, that the photographer actually put on the real scene um, and therefore the way that you set up the cameras and the algorithms are used to then transform that into 3D model are very different um, and the output is more for the real but it's not one to be relit and animated so it's very much that's where the difference definition becomes between a 3D scan and a sculptural photograph from our point of view because a sculptural photograph is as I say something that is um, the content in its own right and all of the algorithms are set towards preserving what was actually there rather than um, creating an asset to be deformed. Sure. Great. Um, thanks very much for sharing some of the, the stories there. I was wondering if you could uh, comment a little bit about, about the future. You know, we've, we've kind of been led through a little journey here and we're at interactive entertainment stage. Mm. Obviously mobile devices, um, the importance of those in the industry can't be underestimated as well as the kind of gaming um, you know, something that Apple tried for a long time to break into into the kind of games industry, or, or maybe not tried, but they were you know kind of on the sidelines and suddenly thrust right into the the middle of it, maybe uh, fortuitously or unexpectedly with the arrival of the the iPhone, this powerful CPU attached to a small display. Is what is the GK? What is the potential for working more in the kind of games? Well, as interactive um, well, we're sort of. I'm really fascinated in the digital interactive experience that is not a game. You know, I think that the interactive entertainment industry um, at the moment is one of the biggest industries in the world, and it's supported mainly by eight-year-old boys up to 35. You know, and um, that's really just like one quarter of the world's population. And I'm interested in using these same technologies to create interactive entertainment experiences that don't require you to score points. It would be great to be able to, you know, have a young woman download the Milan Catwalk on her Xbox One one day and mm -hmm. use, you know, our technologies to explore, you know, that real event or buy the football match or for your PS4, you know, that we would use your controller to view the actual foot ma match from any angle and enjoy it in a different way than you would sort of the vicarious way that we watch sort of television. In essence, the uh, is the way this is supposed to go is to become a content that's far less vicarious than the fixed point of view tech, uh, media that we, 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 we are sort of fed through television on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, this is something that celebrates your unique point of view and gives you the freedom to see content from any which angle you want. I think there's some really interesting, when we start moving into motion, and, uh, and and start to, to look at maybe interfacing with technologies like the Oculus Rift uh, in a more meaningful way, then we start to create some digital experiences that I think could um, really uh, challenge, you know, the way that we uh, start to experience, you know, the recorded world. You know, for 100 years, we've only had two different ways of showing people uh, a, a recorded moment of, of, of the world, you know, and that's through photography or motion picture. Now we've got a means of showing it that allows you to see it any which way you want, and I think that's got a significant, it's going to have significant effect on the way we, um, you know, see our own, uh, the way we think about the world around us. Mm -hmm. And the students then here going into the fourth year, like we said at the start, they're establishing their major projects, testing out some ideas now in this module. Into the into the real world then, into um, the space outside of education, have you got any tips for these young practitioners who are going to be um, Next kind of wave. Any tips for getting into industry or? Yeah, know that you're know that you're valuable. I mean, I think what we're trying to do is kind of just look at that 
you know, there's people that are getting into special effects and then these types of technologies are, you know, are people that, I think, I think that the content industry for years has relied on static mo motion pictures and static photographs and now is starting to have to rely on a whole different bunch of skill sets. Um, developers uh, are starting to be a staple requirement for the marketing industry, you know, uh, which is interesting. And so too are um, people who make in these type of unique types of content and have skills in CGI, etc. You know, your skills are now starting to get demand, uh, are in demand from lots of different industries, and you know, um, the television industry and the film industry hasn't yet understood that so you know, make sure that you don't get um, trampled on too much by those guys mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I think it'd be a good time to open up to questions so uh, to the class here and then we've got a few people following along online as well which are hopefully some of the fourth year students on, for the online people first of all I've turned the question module on uh, you will need to follow the link I pasted on the Facebook group to the actual Google Hangout to ask questions. You won't be able to ask the questions for YouTube, so if you go back to the Facebook link, follow it to the Google Hangout, and at the bottom right, there's a space to ask questions. Um, but then, while we're waiting for hopefully someone to ask some questions there, I'll send it over to the guys which are with us in the class. Um, I'll invite them to ask a question, and I'll just put it through the microphone on here as well. So, any questions for Callum, you think? Be shy. <laughs> just relate to me. Yeah, if you relate to me, I'll just I'll put it through the. So he's asking about. Did you cave the size of the company um, and how many people are directly employed? Um, with business? So we've got um, 12 employees and our sister company's got four um, uh, up in London. So it's kind of, we share most of our, the, the main part of our company's in Brighton and then the studio's up in London. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think, um, you employ like, like, in the did you hear that? He was asking about uh, freelance artists as well. So you've got projects yeah. on like Captain America. Do you bring people in to... Yeah, we do actually. I mean, we have... Um, I tend to err on, and I have done throughout the session as well, like, trying to give people a full-time job. I think um, it's complex. It's, it's, it's difficult to, to do that. You've got to be very careful with that because it's, um, it's, it's, it's tricky. Uh, so we kind of half and half. Sometimes we can, I think a, a large project will expand to about maybe 30 people. So we can have a lot of contractors working for something. So the question was about um, at the acquisition stage how that technology is evolving. You mentioned about live events, about being able to capture um, the live event with the rig and, and how that could be evolving into the motion picture industry as well that you could capture live. Movement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, movement has been, you can capture movement from devices like the Connect and this, but it's woefully, uh, the quality is woefully poor, you know, even the Connect 2 that we have. So it's all about, you know, bringing things to a sort of certain standard that's acceptable, really. Um, and, you know, that sort of huge amount of data processing, fundamentally, actually, the system that we use can be used to capture motion, but um, cost of the rig, we would have to have you know, um, instead of 60 Nikon D800 cameras, we would have to have 60 Epic, you know, uh, cameras, you know, which is a bit more of a financial outlay. Um, the other side to it is, 
the speed of which you can render that and you know actually process everything that's kind of where the work lies to be honest every single time we take a frame it's 1.6 gigapixels so we with our system we're shooting as fast as a photographer wants to shoot so that they can get those natural moments i mean in this particular instance with the captain america chris evans had a had a uh, bungee rope attached to his back so that he could stretch forward and have a good kind of uh, pose, you know, as he kind of pushed through the, the supposed the, the glass. Um, to capture that moment, you need to capture as quick as a normal photography studio thing, and that, that, that's, that's been pretty tricky to get the system up to that capability. Um, obviously, the next step in motion is uh, an exciting one, and we certainly have the theories to be able to do it, but it's the practicalities. We work with um, UCL and Oxford University as uh, a partner in CIHA um, with their PhDs and we also have um, working with the Technology Strategy Board here in the UK um, to further our development. Fundamentally Digicave might be a small company but at least three of our team at any one time is purely working on our own internal software tools developing these technologies. Mm -hmm. Building up 3D models of narratives yeah, is the question. Oh, that's interesting. Can you repeat that? So, uh, yeah, so like freeing the camera is talking about building up a narrative from that. So yeah. the camera is kind of freed, kind of like the time freeze kind of. Absolutely. Thing. So I mean, you, I mean, if I'm understanding your question correctly, and if you just confirm uh, this, I, are you talking about new types of narrative that um, we need to explore because we're freeing the camera? Yeah, in a way that two people. Or, uh, you can view things and from different perspectives and stuff. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great. That's a really great question. I mean, absolutely, you bang on it. I mean, this is where it gets very exciting. I mean, the first sort of forays that we're having conceptually about it is, you know, do you start actually looking at physical juxtaposition <laughs> as a means? Really excited. Sorry, what happened? Hello. Hi. Yeah, we've got you again. Mm -hmm. It was really exciting, and then it froze for a second. Okay, um, yeah, so basically like, um, yeah, looking at like mechanisms like where physical juxtaposition starts to create meaning, you know, and this type of thing, you know, is quite fascinating. Also, um, when you start freeing up uh, what people find interesting, I mean, working as an editor, I had to uphold a lot of the norms, you know, for what is beautiful and what isn't beautiful, what someone should look at, when they should look at it, and for how long. Uh, these are the types of restrictions that I'm interested in sort of taking away from people and, and, and having dem democratically evolve, you know. And so, you know, if we have a, the questions kind of start to become fascinating when you have, you know, say a, a central character comes into a scene, you know, what are you as an individual finding interesting about that character? Is it his nose? Is it his feet? Is it his hairstyle? Is it his body language? I mean, these are questions that are answered to you and answered for you by filmmakers and current motion mix picture kind of techniques. Actually, you know, this media will probably, I'd suggest, sort of take uh, a lot of lead from maybe the theatre in the round and old mechanisms of, of, of um, you know, creating content, you know, in, in more physical ways. Yes. Got an online question here um, regarding the importance of your degree classification versus your portfolio. So he says, what would be the criteria of young specialists to start working? Um, what skills are you looking for? Is it a 2-1 diploma degree more important than a portfolio for a place in the company? Well, uh, I got first class honours and awards, and I, uh, but I also did a good portfolio. I think that, to be honest, I mean, I will hire people that don't have two ones necessarily, but I do feel very reassured if they've got a first class honours because it basically shows me someone that can apply themselves and actually, you know, um, you know, hit a sort of certain criteria, you know, ha analyze critically, analyze, you know, what the what the the requirement is to fulfil a certain um, situation, you know, so. Uh, you know, it, it's a tricky one. I mean, I put. I think that. I think that that, that 
my personal, I'd, I'd feel reassured if you had a first or a 2-1, but if you had a really good portfolio, then I would consider you, you know, but it, it's, it's, you know, it certainly helps. I think there should never be an excuse not to succeed. Yeah. I think the, um, it's a very obviously individual situation, uh, and it's very difficult to kind of blanket that, but if someone gets a good degree course, then obviously it shows that they're doing something right. Well, that's right, because actually the lessons in doing a degree well are um, similar, you know, to um, uh, the lessons that you need to show that you can do it outside of life. You can apply yourself, you can do things on time, you can critically analyze your own work and others. I mean, these are some of the key guidelines to any uh, type of degree. And fundamentally, that's core to how you should practice in the professional world as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's good to show, to use your degree as a means of demonstrating to yourself and to others that you're capable of, of working within certain guidelines and boundaries. It's not just about how good your work is, it's very much how well do you work in a team, how professional are you. Um, I would, you know, nine times out of ten I'd go with somebody that works better in a team and is more professional than someone who's more talented because um, most of the time from a business point of view it's about delivering things on time, it's about delivering things on budget, it's about communicating your ideas well within a team uh, so that you know your projects can go out and, in an effective way in the way which it was designed. That's a very difficult thing to do and um, talent is important um, in terms of getting something special but in terms of getting the wages paid from every month, um, getting things done on time and well is more is more important. Great, thanks very much. Is there any more questions from? Yeah. The question was about um, particular software packages. Is there anything that you um, that you're in particular looking for 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 your company? Yeah, so like we definitely do you know Maori, the uh, part of the foundry. foundry. Yeah, that's a fantastic software package. We output our three D models with PTEX textures, um, which are kind of uh, sort of giant textures. Uh, you probably guys are probably working with that, and Mari supports that. So we see Mari as one of the best sort of tools for touching things up, and in, in, in when something has super tech, super sized mm -hmm. textures. Um, I mean, most of the tools we actually, all, most of our tools are in house. Even our have you guys used? Yeah, geometry tools Ooh. inside, and we're not licensing them yet, and so they're not. But we will probably be starting to license uh, light versions of our tools next year. Okay. Um, um, so we'll be opening a beta program. Excellent. Yeah, we have. Um, we just invested in um, licenses for the Foundry's Nuke software. Fantastic! Yeah, yeah. great. So this is one of the first years. These are the first kind of um, students coming through who have, have been doing some technical challenges, and their coursework's based on that. In a minute, the 3D stuff they're still using um, Maya, but we're hoping to as well, obviously, make the most of the the suite of software that we have and the generosity of the Foundry in providing these education licenses for, for students as well. Yeah, the, the Foundry are a great team. I mean, we, we know Bill and the guy and, uh, from, and they just, I think their software is the top end of, so it's the way all software should be made, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Callum, for the time. It's, it's oh, sorry, there's one more online question. Um, on average, how many projects are undertaken at one time, and how are these managed efficiently? Um, pretty much, I think we try not to take more than four at the same time. I mean, at the moment, we had last month, I think we were on four projects. Um, the way that that's managed is through really good digital producers. Um, so, yeah. so we had a little freeze there, so we oh, missed so on how many how many people you would actually take uh, on. Projects, projects. Did you say? Is it projects or people? Uh, on average, how many projects, projects are taken on at a time, and how are these managed effectively? Yeah, so so we would take on about um, uh, no more than maybe four projects at the same time at the moment. I mean, um, 
uh, that would be with a lot of contractors in at the same time and that's what we were last from January February actually um, we had about four projects going on at the same um, so you're quite uh, the, the, the way to do that is to have really good digital producers I mean your producer is your is is your hero really and a lot of really good pre-production and um, making sure that you are interfacing with the client well, but your protection, protecting your production team from the client at the same time. Um, you, you, need to, you need to also um, account manage your client really well. You need to make sure that their expectations are managed, um, that you uh, forcibly tell them when and when they can and can't interfere or interface with the production and what times they have. Uh, that they, they, they're able to, um, to to bring their input on board. If you don't do that, if you don't manage the expectations <coughs> of your client, and you um, don't give them, provide them with a, a strong guideline as what the, your um, production timeline is going to be, you'll find them using every hour of your day and um, making it nigh on possible for you to create an efficient production chain. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Pam, for no. your time there explaining that. That's good. Um, I'll put the um, the link online so students can access the video afterwards and hopefully have some. Kind of yeah. Um, brilliant. Cool. Thank you, guys. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. 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 <laughs>